I was talking to someone recently and they were thinking about, you know, the possibility of having to do something and they said, wow, that just, the thought of that makes my blood pressure go up. Can you relate to that? And interestingly, not long after that, I was talking to someone else who said, they were telling me, I'm not going to be here Labor Day weekend because we're going to the beach. And she just paused and said, and I can just feel myself relaxing when I think about that. And then Rev. Deborah, I told a, son, a story last Sunday about her grandson, Elion. Elion told Deborah, she said, how do you feel after Sunday school? And what did he say? He said, after Sunday school, I feel happy and chill. <laughs> I hope you feel happy and inspired and chill after the Sunday services. The point is that we encounter things, we take on things, thoughts, ideas the, that can cause literally our pressure to go up. We can think about things that can help us relax and let go. And we can experience things that help us be happy and chill and connected or not. Well, today, the month of September, we're beginning a series this month that is titled Awakening Your Higher Self a journey to divine potential. Awakening your higher self. And so we're going to talk about today as we sort of create some foundation and we'll dig much deeper throughout the next few weeks. But number one, what is the higher self? What are we talking about? What are the fruits or the natural byproducts of one's higher self? And then how do you bring it to the forefront of your life if that's something you choose to do? So let me begin with a story. Once upon a time, at a picnic for a Catholic school, the mother superior stacked a pile of apples on one end of the table with a sign that said, Take only one apple, please. God is watching. <laughs> on the other end of the table was a big plate of brownies. And so one of the second grade students placed a sign that said, take all the brownies you want, God is watching the apples. <laughs> I love the rationale and what it really points to. God is watching you. Santa Claus is coming, <laughs> you know. Those motivators uh, or uh, as an uh, admonishment for correction really don't hold up that long. Or, the devil made me do it, doesn't stand up in court. <laughs> I don't think it stands up in karmic court either. That God is watching you, the devil made me do it, is not really going to hold up pointing to anything outside of us and expecting it to keep us within the self that we want to be is really not going to work unless and until we begin to develop self-awareness, self-discipline, what we could call self-actualization, how we express ourselves, And this is where the higher self that we're talking about comes in. And so when we talk about the higher self, how many of you are familiar with the term? I should probably say, is there anyone that's not? I'm sure all of you, whether it's a yoga class, watching an Oprah series, sitting in any kind of spiritual community, you've probably heard the term higher self. At its essence, we're talking about the spiritual I, your spiritual self-identification, beyond the form it's the I am. In the Christian scriptures, that's what it's called, is I am that I am. It's that part of us. It's what Jesus was referring to when he said, I of myself can do nothing. But when I am one with the creator, when I am operating from that level of awareness, I become an instrument for a greater power and a greater presence to express through me. That's what he was talking about in the I am. Now, the higher self, again, is referred to by many different names, many terms, and interestingly, it shows up in many different faith traditions. 
It's the activating presence, the guiding force, if you will, of our spirit human being. It's also in Christian scriptures referred to as the Holy Spirit, higher power, the indwelling Christ. In Buddhism, it would be called the Buddha nature. In Hinduism, it would be called the Atman, that, that aspect of every being that is itself an expression of the Brahman, the One. In Sufism, it's called Nafs al-Amara, the commanding self. In Judaism, it's called Nashim, the highest soul expression operating within us. In Taoism, it's called the true self or the original self. Other names, it's called the higher consciousness, higher spirit self, true self, authentic self. But the common thread is the recognition is that there's more to us than meets the eye. That yes, we're a being of five senses. Yes, we are mind, body, spirit with all these senses and, 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 and an earthly being. And that's not a mistake. That is not something you have to get rid of or apologize for. Can I get an amen for that? That that's just as holy and as spiritual as anything else. As a matter of fact, that's the suit that you were given to, be, to, to animate the spirit that you are. But what happens in life is we tend to forget. I'm sure you've heard the story of the baby was um, a, a little three-year-old boy just had a brand new little baby sister born and the mom and overheard the little three-year-old by the newborn baby crib saying tell me what it's like I forgot I'm forgetting that there's a part of us that never does forget there's a part of us that always knows we're connected that doesn't know anything else there's a part of us that doesn't get in the way but it is the way And that part of us is the higher self. And again, known by many names. So don't let, hopefully you won't let that languaging get in the way. Find what works for you. It guides us in self-realization, self-mastery, self-transformation, self-actualization, self-expression. When I was in seminary, Robert Brummett, one of our teachers, um, would talk about this and he would say don't ever get your selves mixed up you have your big s self and your little s self and your little s self can totally forget that there's a big s capital s this higher self the original self the holy spirit we're talking about the capital s because it's an expression of the one self, the one power, the one presence. So it's the presence of truth in life and light. It's the source of your voice of intuition. It's the source of wisdom and compassion. All the fruits of the spirit flow through this higher self. It's an inner compass that guides us. And it's always leading us. There's a saying in the Jewish Talmud that says there's an angel over every blade of grass that whispers, grow, grow, grow. Well, there's something over each and every one of us that is whispering, grow, actualize, manifest your soul's potential, be the light of the world. Jesus said you are the light of the world. And so they're saying, be it, demonstrate it, bring it to life. The higher self leads us into the fulfillment of our soul's potential. The individualized light within, it stimulates your desire to transform, to evolve into a more loving, compassionate, more wise being. Many people in 12-step programs have encountered what we would call the higher self through the doorway of a higher power, of reaching a point in one's life when you literally cannot go on any longer the way you have been traveling about planet Earth. And the person realizes that to surrender is not a giving up. It's simply a giving up the idea that who you are in that moment in time is all you can ever be. It's giving up the belief that you're stuck in that way of being. And so it becomes a giving over and really increasing the bandwidth of your being, if you will. 
It's increasing the bandwidth of what you express and experience and how you show up. And that's what we're going to be really digging into this month as to how do we become those instruments of our higher self. Children are also often the very best teachers. There's another story of a little girl who was dressed in her brand new outfit. And she was running as fast as she could trying to get to school and get into her classroom because it was picture day. And she didn't want to miss, and so she's running, running, running in her brand new little dress, and her feet get tripped up like mine did, and she falls down and takes a spill, and she gets up, and she's, and she's running, running, running the whole time. She's saying, Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. I don't want to miss picture day. Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. But she takes that tumble, she gets up and brushes herself off and starts again, and she says, Dear Lord, please don't let me be late, but don't shove me either. <laughs> <laughs> and you know we have those conversations and yet hopefully we reach a point in our life where we realize that there's God is not manipulating us doing things to us but the presence that we call God is like a, is a spirit. The scriptures tell us that God is not a form. God has a spirit, an energy, a vitality, a living, living water. And it's operating as us. And so, yeah, we, we relate in many different ways. But ultimately what we're bringing about is waking up and living out and, and knowing our true identity. So that's what the, when we talk about your higher self, we're talking about an inherent part of who you are, always there. Nothing can take it away. However, we can learn to drown out the voice. We can become so habituated and begin to see ourselves. There's a saying with a picture of a frog that's at the bottom of a well. And the frog is looking up from the bottom of the well and this is all that that can see. And the saying says, the frog thinks the world is only as big as the top of the well, but if the frog could surface, it would see a whole different reality. So in our, in our being life, as we go through our somebody training in this world and we learn who you are and what you excel at, who you're not, how many of you, let's just pause a moment, how many females in the room wanted to be a priest when you grew up? Okay, three of us. <laughs> and somebody said, oh, you can't do that. We're, we're conditioned that what you can do, you can't do. You can have, you can't. You can think this, that, and the other. And so we have that. And part of waking up to the higher self is beginning to realize that's just how I see the world. But if I surface and our higher self is that which holds the big picture. It's always holding your next best step. It holds the key to what you're ready to express next. It's that connecting force. It's a guiding presence that is always guiding you, whispering, grow, 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 as you are ready to grow in your life. That's the Holy Spirit, the higher self. And it's very much alive and well and a part of each and every one of us. And so then what are the fruits of a higher self, of, of being awake to this. Well, for me, it's often interesting to approach it from a different way. And so I would first ask, well, what are the byproducts of an unawakened higher self? What are the byproducts of an individual, of a life, when the only thing you believe is that you are what you see in the mirror? The only thing you believe you're capable of is what you've done in the past. The only help you ever believe you're ever going to get is what you can generate just from your own brain, so to speak, and with your, your own hands. And I'm not saying that you don't use your brain and you don't work, but I'm saying that we learn to open and become available to higher guidance and to new ways of being. So what are the byproducts of someone who's not aware at all? Well, there's very egocentric behavior. Now, the ego is not a bad thing. The ego gets a bad rap. An ego is an instrument. It's an instrument to experience the self. It's an instrument to relate. The problem is when we confuse the instrument with the presence. 
And when the ego, because the ego is always concerned about self-image and self-preservation, always. The soul is concerned about self-awareness and self-expression. And so we begin to learn when we have egocentric behavior, emotional turmoil, a lack of true purpose, shallow relationships, unfulfilled relationships, limited awareness, resistance to change, feeling stuck, trying to force or manipulate. I had the pleasure a number of years ago of being on an Alaskan cruise and at one of the ports when we stopped, rather than choosing um, you know, one of the excursions, my prayer partner who was on the cruise with me, we decided to get bikes and just go out in that part of Alaska and ride a bicycle. And it was so beautiful, but something, we both stopped dead in our tracks when we saw this sign. And the sign said, choose your rut carefully, next hundred miles. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I realized in Alaska, when it warms up and the ice melts, the dirt, when the vehicles start to go, it creates ruts very quickly and then it freezes so hard, you're stuck. And so that sign says, choose your rut carefully. And think about that. Have you ever spent years fighting over which rut you would be in? <laughs> Versus realizing, I don't have to be in a rut. There's a different way here. So not being awakened to our higher self is being stuck in those ruts. It's power struggles. It's being spiritually disempowered, which translates into every area of our life. It's being caught up in power struggles, control issues, feeling empty, fearful, lacking, disconnected, lacking genuine peace and compassion and connection. Well, the beauty of that, if, if the roots to what disconnect us lie within us, then the roots to what connect us also lie within us. And so the byproducts, when we begin to understand what are the fruits of, of being awake, of recognizing there's a higher power, a higher self, a Holy Spirit that is not only operating within me, that, but that is, I am it and it is me, it's a part of me. And, and if I'm suppressing it, if I'm not bringing it to life, then a part of me is withering, is depressed, is dying, is stifled. A part of me is struggle. A part of me is unfulfilled and unmet. And so just like a child must grow, I, I was on the phone yesterday, my whole family with my little niece, my brother, his family are now living in Portugal. My little niece turned two. And so we all got to sing happy birthday over Zoom to, to her there. And I look at that little two-year-old and I think, gosh, I can't wait to see her grow because you children grow and mature and this builds upon this, builds upon this, builds upon this. It's the same in the spirit world. Sometimes people look at, at, at a spiritual master or a highly evolved person and say, well, if I'm here and I'm not there, something's wrong with me. You would never look at a two-year-old and a college student and say something's wrong with the two-year-old. You would understand they're at different phases of development. They're at different phases of actualizing and demonstrating their potential. And so it is with our soul. And that's why it's so important not to compare. It's important to self-reflect, but to do our, our very best. And so to begin to realize what the what the fruits of our spirit of knowing that we are this Holy Spirit. I want to share with you a poem. This poem comes from Tukaram. He was a Vakara saint from the 17th century. He was a spiritual poet and considered a saint in India, again, back in the 17th century. And this is what he wrote. He said, I was meditating with my cat the other day, and all of a sudden she shouted, What happened? I knew exactly what she meant but encouraged her to say more, feeling that if she got it all out on the table, she would be, a, be better able to sleep that night. So I responded, tell me more, dear kitty. And she soulfully meowed. Well, I was mingled with the clouds and the sky and the galaxies and the light, and now look, I'm landlocked in fur. <laughs> I'm landlocked in fur. To say, to this I said, I know exactly what you mean, dear kitty. What to say about a conversation between mystics. <laughs> I'm landlocked 
infer. To, to feel like we're landlocked in this body, that we're landlocked in the ideas, our, our, our whatever we can think of in this moment, that we're landlocked in that is to be, to, to be operating and forgetting that there is a, a higher power, a Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And so the way that what the fruits of this look like in our life is first and foremost, there's a sense of peacefulness. The Tao says, the Tao is like a well. It is used but never used up. It is hidden but it is always present within you. When you look for it, there's nothing to see. When you listen for it, there's nothing to hear. But when you use it, it is inexhaustible. When you use your higher power, when you use the Holy Spirit life force, when you begin to call on it and use it, it is inexhaustible. And so the fruits of, of knowing what it is to have that higher self and the Holy Spirit operating in our life is there's a sense of connection. It's not a dramatic thing in general that happens just like this. We get glimpses of it. We begin to realize a different way. A child comes to Sunday school and experiences something that says, how did he say it again, Deborah? I feel happy and chill. I feel happy and chill. That there are things I can do, ideas, there's things that I can experience that begin to create a different atmosphere inside of me. The fruits of the Spirit are that sense of connection, of being guided, of realizing that you are an instrument. And so let's break it down to the next step, and that is, so how? So how do we begin to bring it to the forefront of our life? And we're going to touch on just four things, and then again, we're digging into this this month. If we don't bring it to the forefront of our life, we are really limiting access to who we are, to all that we are. So the first thing, a practical thing that we do, how do we begin to bring our spiritual self, our identity, the higher power to the forefront of our life? Anybody want to guess number one? Ask and pray. Pray, believe, ask, meditate. Meditate, pray. Those things, it's to take, it's to carve out space every day, to carve out some space where you're spending time in prayer and meditation. Perhaps reading things that are of a higher vibration, things that reflect this, things that are holding this truth for you, helping you begin to assimilate it and hold it for yourself. You immerse yourself in the presence. We carve out that time. Now some of you will say, I don't know how to meditate. I've tried it a bunch of times and my mind never stops. Well, you're in good company because the minute your mind does completely stop, you will be in that graveyard that I fell in the other day. <laughs> I was able to get up and out. <laughs> that the mind never completely stops. What begins to happen, we live our life as if, if you look up at the sky and see the clouds moving by, we live our life just so caught up in the motion, we forget that we can step back and watch it. The practice of meditation and doing this over and over again is you begin to become aware of that part of you that is the witness that holds it all. That you can begin to differentiate from the experience you're having rather than your experiences always just totally consume you. That's the first key, is to, to meditate upon it, pray upon it, ask. And then the second is very much like that. It is to seriously call upon it. Now I'm using, again, language is tricky. I say it as if it's something separate from you. It's, but you could, say, you could refer to your foot as a part of you and still an it. The Holy Spirit, the higher self, is a part of you to begin to call upon it. One of our members who couldn't be here today, next Sunday, she's going to share a very short story with you about a practice that she developed where before she would go in and interact or do anything, she would just pause a minute and, and call on the Holy Spirit, call on her higher self to say, be with me, guide me, speak through me, see through me, know through me. To take those pauses and those practices it sounds like a little thing, and here's the, the thing. It's something that's very doable, yet it will bring about a profound shift in us. If we'll begin to pause 
And before you go in, or before you're having a conversation, or sometimes in the middle of the conversation, you may have to close your eyes and take a breath and say, Holy Spirit, support me, be with me, see through me, help me be present to this. So we call upon it. The third thing is to open to it. If we're going to immerse ourselves in it, meditate upon it, believe in it, ask, call upon it, then the next step is become an opening. And we're not looking for a savior to show up and fix them out here. We're not looking for something to take place and clean up this mess. Now that might happen, and praying for that, you know, Lord knows it can't hurt. But what we're realizing is that if it is to be, it is up to we. That what begins to happen is opportunities get created within us. Sometimes we look at the life of powerful individuals and we think, wow. People look at the life of Rosa Parks and they say, wow. There she was, a, a woman and not all that educated. And she was a black woman in a time living in a place where that was a, a hard plight, a hard challenge. But wow, one day something must have really come over her and she had this incredible amount of courage to stand up and do something. Rosa Parks would say, no, 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 no. I started way back here. I started realizing that this wasn't right. And I started training myself how to be present to it in a way that was nonviolent. I started volunteering for agencies that were working. I actually started taking classes. I started taking steps. And I started disciplining myself. I started learning and praying and growing and growing, so when the opportunity presented itself, she was ready. You see, there's a huge difference when we begin to think it takes a gigantic step by a highly evolved person to make a huge impact. We miss the significance that change really doesn't happen that way usually. It's the steps that we take that create the opportunities for us that will then grow us into who we, be, who we are becoming. And so we, we open to it. And the fourth thing that we do, Richard, would you and the band come on up, is to be the best human you can possibly be. Now, a lot of times, again, we start talking about spiritual stuff and we start envisioning Mother Teresa and the Dalai Lama and all these saints and all these people that have done such things and Jesus and the Buddha, and we think, ugh, Oh, oy vey, I'm so far away. What is that? Is it ever going to amount to anything? The Holy Spirit is already active in your life. Your humanness and your spiritness are not two separate things. You could call them two expressions of, of the one being that you are. And so is there anything that's a higher calling than to be the very best person you can be in the moment, every day? That if you intend to be your best, to be your most honest, most authentic, most compassionate, most wise. If you're tuning in to that dimension, if you're asking, and then if you intend to do that, think about it. Is there really anything more powerful? Let's just imagine that tomorrow, in every nation where there are any politicians or kings or queens or leaders of any shape or size, Let's imagine that if each and every one of them, wherever they were, by whatever they called their God, by whatever they understood a higher power and would open to a presence of love, if every one of them tomorrow would wake up and spend their first 10 minutes opening to the higher presence of love of their being. And then if they take a few minutes to read something inspirational and then literally say a prayer Lord, let me be an instrument of divine light and love. And today, I'm going to commit to be honest, to be truthful, to be the best person I can. And then they went into their government offices and they went about their business in 24 hours around the world. Can you imagine what could happen? Now, let's make it personal. Look around this room. If tomorrow every one of us said, all right, I'm going to do what that woman with the funny shoe up there is saying. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to give her 10 minutes. I'm going to get up 10 extra minutes. Or if you have kids, if you just can't, you figure it out. But you start your day that way. 
you take in something that feeds your spirit and then you speak out your intentions and you do your best to align and then throughout your day all day you're going to do your heavenly best to be your highest and best and you know what that would look like for you and then you're going to probably need to set your timer to remind yourself because we forget very quickly the first time, you know, you're just driving there. Or, or like one of my pet peeves is to be in the grocery store in the short checkout line and the person before you has 18 items because you counted six times and you're in a hurry and they're like taking forever. Those, whatever it is, the sandpaper for your soul most likely is going to come right up for you. And so we're going to need reminders to say, okay, wait a minute. It's okay to be irritated but I don't need to get, I, I'm big enough to hold both of those. You hear what I'm saying? As you're human, you're going to get angry, you're going to get irked, you're going to get irritated, you're going to get confused, you're going to get hurt. And it's about being able to be in relationship with that in a different way. It's not trying to make it go away. It's not trying to pretend you're not irritated because you're going to get irritated. It's not try, trying to pretend that away. It's learning to be in relationship different with it to say, man, this is going on inside of me. Ugh. And I'm holding this. I'm holding a lot. But you know what? There's a flow of life that's holding me. And so I'm going to create an opening here. Help me relate to this differently so that I can still be connected to my own peace, my own joy, my own desire to be a presence of good in the world. How many of you would try that for 24 hours seriously? All right. Let's anchor that with this a chorus to a song that I hope will begin to really resonate with you because when we say, Thy will... It's the highest will of my being, the will of my higher self, my soul, the Holy Spirit. Thy will is done through me this day. As we look back over the landscape of our life, we have been handed other people's ideas of God. We've been offered other images, things to do and not to do. And we're going to see that for what it was, simply an idea presented. And so we now call forth the ability to release all attachments around anything that may have come before that would hinder our ability to be an instrument of spiritual presence. So we let that go. And we become that available slate, the sacred vessel. And we now allow this image in our mind, we envision a beautiful waterfall. Beautiful. And in this moment, we recognize that waterfall as the origin of life. We see it as the starting place of energy. That that waterfall is not only a fall of water, but is the, it is the original fount it is the place where life begins to flow and express. 
And let us call that the divine. Let us call that the creative presence. It is a fountain of life. And we now begin to recognize ourselves as flowing from that, fully made of that, a part of that, supported and held in that. That all that we are flows from the original source. And we realize that as an individual, we can hold on to a lot of things and we give thanks for this ability to be an individualized expression. And yet, let us not forget that no matter what we think, believe it or not, we are always in the flow of life. And so we become the opening, we become the way, as many master teachers have said, we open ourselves enough that we realize that this life is operating through us, that we are here to be instruments of spirit, of divine love, of light. We are here to be sourced in a way that does not cause us to be exhausted. We are here to be inspired in a way that adds something that we of ourselves could probably not have thought up. And yet we have the capacity to take it and then to bring it to earth and to create anew. We are creating time to really open to our identity, to understand what it means to be an instrument of spirit. May we be guided and led and lifted. And may we become the way for this life, this beautiful presence, that the ultimate will of my soul and there's nothing in the world that could bring me more joy for that will, thy will, to express through me this day. Thy will is done through me this day. Thy will is done through me this day. Thy joy will flow through me this day. Thy joy will flow. Thy light will flow through you this day. 